powered by lay-driven leadership, connecting lay ministries and business people to share Christ in the marketplace in support of the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Hello, friends, and welcome to ASI 2023 here in Kansas City, Missouri. It's been a wonderful, wonderful set of days and messages. What do you think, honey, about what's been happening here? I absolutely have been enjoying my time here, meeting people, seminars. I even went to a radio seminar today, right. which because I'm a part of 3ABN Radio. I'm so blessed to meet God's wonderful people from all around the world. That's right. We've had people as far as Zimbabwe, yeah. uh, some people from Canada, some have driven in, many people have flown in. But what makes ASI so wonderful is we're seeing how Jesus is being, is being shared in the marketplace. Uh, these are not pastors. Most of them are lay members yeah. who have businesses who are sharing Jesus on many levels. Mm -hmm. And we've heard some wonderful testimonies. Even Elder Wilson has been here. I know. Oh, Elder Wilson, our general conference president, we are so blessed by his leadership here at, th not 3ABN, but around the world, we are blessed by his leadership. And tonight we'll be hearing from the children. Oh, yes, and the youth. And the youth. Yes. We'll be getting some reports from uh, ASI as it relates to the Ellen White Estates. There's oh, going to yeah. be a special presentation tonight yes. by Duane Esmond, yes. who is the associate director of the Ellen White Estates. That's going to be the main message for right. tonight. Right, right. But and there's music, too. Lots oh, there's going to, Fountain View is going to be singing Oh, yeah, Fountain tonight. View Academy. That's right. And, yes. and there's some wonderful magazines that are each person that has come. If yeah. you're not far away and you're watching this, maybe you can get in your car and come and join us. We've always had uh, a chance to meet people and yeah. said, your life has made a difference in our lives. Yes. And our prayer is that ASI has been impressing you on how you can share Jesus in, in the, the marketplace. marketplace. But something different tonight that we're gonna to introduce to our audience is yes. join us right now for the hymn sing that's gonna take place behind us. Welcome to ASI. God bless. Good evening. We invite you into our living room for a Friday evening musical worship, a time to celebrate God's goodness, his faithfulness, his leading, and his creative power. You know, family worship time is a beautiful opportunity to connect with our children, to worship together, and to direct our hearts towards heaven. Revelation 4, verses 8 to 11, casts an inspiring vision of worship. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. We invite you to sing with us this evening as we lift our voices in praise to God.
Sometimes it's easy to get distracted by all the challenges that life throws at us and forget the blessings that God has given us. There's a poem that I like that says, count your blessings instead of your crosses, count your gains instead of your losses, count your joys instead of your woes, count your friends instead of your foes. Let's talk about some blessings. Maybe Michael and then Elliot and then Grandma Linda. Could you each share with us a blessing from this past week? I got to go swimming with my mom last morning. It was very fun. We were able to meet a man at a donut shop. He was able to give us some yummy donuts. And we got to share Jesus with him and pray with him. It was amazing. And I've really had fun this week being with my family. It's very special to see how all the grandkids have grown. When upon life's pillows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your many blessings and name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings. like a piece of birch bark. You know, God's made so many really neat things in nature to show us how much he loves us. Elizabeth, what does this bark tell you about how God loves you? Just like it protects the tree, Jesus promises that he will protect me. That is so special, Elizabeth. Thank you for sharing with everyone here. Let's sing a song about the beauty of God's nature. This is my father's world. Oh 
some missionaries that went to Peru to share Jesus. So many amazing miracles happened in their life and so many challenges too. The stories of their service really taught me about serving others and about trusting in God even in difficult times. You, you know Enoch, years ago I felt like I wasn't doing a big enough work for the Lord. I, I thought that maybe traveling to a distant land to serve the Lord was what would make a real impact for God. But I stumbled on this quote in Child Guidance that reinforced the importance of home missionary work for me. And the quote goes like this, as workers for God, our work is to begin with those nearest. It is to begin in our own home. There is no more important missionary field than this. The management and instruction of children is the noblest missionary work that any man or woman can undertake. I love the song that says, do not wait until some deed of greatness you may do. Do not wait to shed your light afar to the many duties ever near you now be true. Brighten the corner where you are. Let's sing that together.
thinking about how recently, when hard times come in life, so many teens my age, and adults for that matter, try to find peace in all the wrong places. You are so right, Amy. It's so easy to get distracted by the many problems that are in this world. In fact, sometimes I even have trouble sleeping when I start thinking about some of the minor issues I am facing. Our Bible tells us in John 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you not as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I'm so glad that God has the answers for the storms in our lives. Fathomless bills of love. How incredible. I can hardly comprehend what that means. I'm reminded of a verse in Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Oh, how much I love Jesus because he first loved me. Let's sing about that now. There is a name.
Recently, it seems like a lot of people in our church and community are struggling with illness, facing financial challenges, or having family problems. It seems like our prayer lists are getting longer and longer. Kind of goes along with the uh, song we just sang, Are We Weak and Heavy Laden, Cumbered with a Load of Care? But you know, the only answer to all the problems of life is Jesus' love, not only for us, but also the importance of us sharing that love with others. And so why don't we sing a song about how love can make us happy, can transform our lives, and in turn, we want to share that happiness with others. Tis love that makes us happy. Sorrow, I'll sing this death and sin. With loving hearts, we'll do our part. 
share God's love and make other people happy. Elizabeth, that's just like the little kid's song. Do you remember the little kid's song, Sabbath is a Happy Day? Yes. That's one of my favorite songs. It reminds us that Sabbath is a happy day that we can spend with Jesus and we can share Jesus and help to bring joy and happiness to other people. On Sabbath, I like going to the nursing home and playing for the residents there. I love seeing the smiles on their faces. We like going for hikes and stopping our neighbors to visit with them. Or we enjoy visit inviting them over for a meal on Sabbath. They love it so much, and we do too. You know, I really just can't wait to see how God pours out a special blessing this Sabbath and how he opens doors to share God's love, especially while we are here at ASI. Isaiah 58 tells us that when we make Sabbath a delight and honor him, then we will find our joy in the Lord. As we close our family worship time, let's sing a favorite song to remind us of how special the Sabbath really is. Let's bow our heads as we close our worship time. Dear Lord, we are thankful for the Sabbath. We are thankful for this holy time where we can gather to worship you, to encourage one another, and to think on your love for us. Bless this program as it goes forward, we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. For 38 years, Three Angels Broadcasting Network has set the benchmark for Christian lifestyle programming designed to mend broken people. 3ABN's innovative approach focuses on physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being through television programming that is proven to be life-changing. From promoting healthy lifestyles to nurturing relationships with God, viewers around the world have come to rely on 3ABN's three distinct categories of powerful content for restoring their hope. Start your journey to a healthier lifestyle with 3ABN's cooking shows and exercise programs. Learn from experienced chefs, lifestyle coaches, dietitians, and more as you discover how easy it is to prepare quick, nutritious, and delicious plant-based meals. 
3ABN offers a wide range of health presentations hosted by top healthcare professionals to provide our viewers with the latest scientifically backed findings in disease prevention and reversal. 3ABN provides a unique platform for viewers of all ages to enhance their relationships, improve emotional well being, and ultimately discovering healing through Jesus Christ. 3ABN is dedicated to creating spiritually enriching content designed to foster spiritual growth in its dedicated viewers. It's also a great resource for those looking to take their faith journey even further or discovering 3ABN while channel surfing. Our wide variety of topics include salvation through Jesus Christ by grace through faith, biblically sound teaching and preaching with special emphasis on prophecy, and the truth found in Daniel and Revelation. Experience the inspiring music and engaging stories of faith-based artists. Our flagship program, 3ABN Today, showcases remarkable real-life stories about those who have faced challenging experiences but discovered peace amidst it all. Three Angels Broadcasting Networks is the perfect destination for meaningful, wholesome content that everyone in your family can enjoy. Get familiar with 3ABN's programming and share this valuable resource with your community. Good evening, ASI. I think I heard about 10 people. I think there are a few more of you out there. Good evening, ASI. Have you been blessed so far this week? You know, I love meeting old friends and fellow workers in ministry here at ASI, and I was just counting. Just today, I heard reports in, from the world field from Guam and Brazil, Ukraine, Zambia, and Malaysia, just to name a few. We can see the Lord's work right here at ASI. And Tim, what have you been uh, most impressed with this week? I think that my favorite is probably the personal testimonies. Anyone agree? That's right. And if you want to share the blessings from ASI, I'd just like to let you know that the recordings are available on Audioverse as well as the 3ABN Plus website, already available for you to share with your friends. But now that the Sabbath is almost here, I can truthfully say that the best is yet to come. And so I invite you to join us as we invite the Lord's presence with us tonight as we open this service with prayer. Tim? Let's bow our heads. Dear Father in heaven, as the Sabbath hours are fast upon us, we want to take this moment to pause and just lay our ministries and perhaps our businesses, our professions ourselves before you. And as you cleanse us and transform us, may we be able to be revived unto witness. And we thank you that you are here with us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, everyone. I'm the third wise man from the East here. <laughs> something, 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 something happened in the year 1849. D8 resulted in 2300 to 1844 to MHP, 10C to 7, SOG to AR. What does this progression of codes mean? A group of Adventist believers studied Daniel chapter 8 and they unlocked the 2300 year day prophecy, understanding the sanctuary would be cleansed starting in the year 1844. They understood Jesus was ministering upstairs in heaven in the most holy place and there inside the most holy place was the Ten Commandments of which the Sabbath commandment was to be restored, which was to be the seal of God at the end of time when the mark of the beast would be, would be enforced. How were God's people to be uh, prepared for the receiving of the seal of God? How were God's people to be prepared before Jesus' return? James White created the Present Truth publication, which would eventually become to be known as the Adventist Review. 
seeking to unite God's people, inform God's people, circulate Bible truth to God's people, and inspire God's people with what God was doing in his church. Five years after 1844, 1849 was when one of American Protestantism's and Adventism's oldest publication was founded to prepare God's people for his return. Today, we seek to restore the following elements. Three things. Number one, history. There was some good stuff that the Lord revealed to Adventists throughout our history. We need this generation and the next generation to connect and understand our prophetic identity and message as Seventh-day Adventists. Number two, mission. Jesus is coming soon. But he's not coming that soon because there's some events that need to happen. Yes, the sealing of God, the mark of the beast, but also mission to the ends of the earth and to the ends of our neighborhoods. With Christianity only one-third of the world, we still have 66% of the world to reach for Jesus. How dare we think, oh well, the two-thirds is just going to go away. Number three, innovation. The printing press was on the cutting edge of technology. We must continue to ask questions of how to disseminate the prophetic voice of Adventism, repurposing the old and utilizing the newest methods and media. How can we push all of our technologies to push our Adventist history and Adventist mission forward? Adventist Review Media, through its Bible-based content, both print and digital, that's videos, articles, podcasts, products on theology, lifestyle experiences, testimonies, and news, seeks to continue its original purpose to unite our church, deepen our historic faith, and to strengthen our identity and responsibility to prepare the world for Jesus' second coming. Before he became the first GC president, John Byington received a copy of the Adventist Review. Back then it was called the Review and Herald in 1852. After reading this one issue, he was converted, he was baptized, and became an activated Adventist. Tonight, we encourage you to do the same. You'll see the Adventist Review copy on some of your seats, and we ask you to do the same, to read this to give this to your conference president and see him converted, baptized, and become an activated Adventist. Or for you to read it and become an activated Adventist and then become conference president. Either way, enjoy this complimentary copy before you. And from behalf of myself and the new editorial team at the Adventist Review, we want to say thank you for your prayers and your support. Happy Sabbath. Good evening, ASI. We are so happy to bring the young people to you tonight to share what they've been learning. Our theme this year was, here I am, send me, I will go. And so every teacher took a spin off of that. My assistant this year has been Rosie Tressenreiter. Good Where are you from, Rosie? Grants Pass, Oregon. You want to say hello, Grants Pass? <laughs> I'm Claire Lustias, and I'm from Oklahoma. <laughs> and this person right here, who's coming back from the airport for, for picking up one of our mission speakers, is Luis Luciano, the evangelism director of Oklahoma and a pastor there. Our team this year has been seven pastors with their wives who decided they would donate their time and some of them their vacation Yes. and teachers. I didn't realize I had all teachers or pastors. What a great team Amen. we have actually had this year. And so, is this Alex? No. I, um, I brought a song for everyone to sing together and so this year has been an explosive year in the youth department. We started out with 333 children pre-registered. Yes. And we're just going up from there. So thank you to all of you who have come and said, I'll go. 
and be with the young people. And we have many volunteers that instead of coming to meetings came and helped. We're going to have a surprise for you at the end, so I'll tell you about that at that point. So I'm looking for Alex. Where are you, Alex? Are you here? Come on over here. I was practicing this song with all the young people, and he came up to me and he said, I know what this song is about. So he told me, he said, teacher, this song is about Samuel because he heard God calling in the night and he said, I will go. So he knew. And I hope that as we sing, here I am, Lord, that you will be inspired this next year to say to God, I will go too and share Jesus' love with someone else. We want to thank Darren Anderson for playing the piano. We've got some soloists that are going to do parts of the song. Nathan Fender, your beautiful string group, thank you for joining us on this song as well. Hi, Alex. Do you remember what you told me? What did you say? The first song is based on the story of Samuel. And what, ha what did Samuel do? He was sleeping and God called him in the night. And what did he say? Here I am. Here I am, Lord. <laughs> Good job. Thank you, Alex. Go ahead. Well, we have a little more time because we have so many coming on the stage. I want you to know we've had some real miracles this year. We've had missionaries from all over the world come and say how they got called to go so that the young people can see. Tomorrow we have a lady from Oklahoma. She found out that if she went to Pizza Hut on Thursday night and offered Bible studies, that she could get up to 10 people every week to take a Bible study with her at Pizza Hut. Everyone has a different ministry. Wherever calls, God calls us, we want to say, I will go. For the first year in any of my time with ASI, we have 45 years of service to ASI by these teachers that you're going to meet. I think that's awesome. And in the end, we had 90 early teens. That's amazing. We have a big year this year, thank the Lord.
And now I'm going to have the kindergarten teachers tell you a little bit. Jody Schaffner comes from Oklahoma. She's a teacher. She had a beautifully decorated room. So Cindy, where are you? Are you with us? All right. So tell us about your program. Our program was sparked by the chapter As a Child by um, on the life of Jesus. And it also is inspired by chapter one in Desire of Ages and Step to Christ. I want the children to know wherever they are and wherever they go, that they are missionaries for Jesus because it's all about Christ in us, his love in us. That's what we are sharing. And our children have a song they'd like to sing to you about what they're learning in class. Okay, can you all see me all right? Sing it one more time, quickly. Let's see if the Let's, mics can we pick them up. Take Stop. it a little faster. We're used to singing it faster in class. <laughs> okay, okay. Stop. Thank you, kindergartners. Thank you. Off you go. Just go. All right, our next very enthusiastic group is led by two people from Colorado, Pastor Skip Dodson and his wife Renee. Their room has just been full of activity, lots and lots of uh, lessons they've learned. And as you can see on their t-shirts, they are God's messengers. So Skip, tell us about your program. So Claire, this week we've been hearing from Bible characters like Joseph, Moses, Noah, and even Adam, who told the story of the first messenger that came to earth with the gospel, none other than the angel of the covenant himself, Jesus, the creator of all things. And then this week, we've also been taking trips to faraway lands in the imagination flights uh, that we've had. Each child has been given a passport, and they've been learning about those countries through mission stories. And we've had also live mission speakers. They've been singing, as you're about to see. We've learned a really cute song. They've been loving their experience, and we're so happy to be part of the primary division at ASI this year.
have primaries now. <laughs> All right, primaries, you can go ahead and go off. And now we come to Pastor Christian Martin. Renee and Skip have been coming for six years. I believe Pastor Martin and his wife started with me years ago, at seven years ago, I think, Pastor Christian. And he is one person you don't want to miss. He has things constantly going. The juniors are a great class. So step forward, juniors, and Pastor Christian, tell us about your group and your days here at ASI. Step forward, juniors. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much. Yes, you are right. The juniors are a dynamite team. They are so full of energy. And when we get together, not only do we like to sit down and learn and share content, but we also like to have a lot of fun. If you can only imagine, we invited Elder Ted Wilson to come and join us for a watermelon eating contest. Can you imagine? And his wife Nancy participated too. And they did amazing. You know, and Elder Doug Batchelor came and joined us as well as we participated in a Bible question or Bible answers live. And what a time we had. Lots of fun, lots of activities. We have been running nonstop. And as we have come together, not only do we have fun, but we also take in information and learn. And I, I have two juniors with me. JJ and Michael, and I'm going to invite them to share with you some of the things they've learned. Uh, we'll begin with JJ. JJ, you know, during our class time, we've been learning many different things, and why don't you tell us what are some of the things that we have learned this year? We have learned to share the gospel. All right, to share the gospel, and, and we learned how to do so in three simple steps. Do you remember what those three simple steps were? Agree that you're a sinner, believe that God has rescued you, and accept eternal life. That, that's it. That's it. Three simple steps. And the juniors learned that the gospel is something that the world needs to hear. And, and not only did we learn how to share the gospel, but we decided we must put it into practice. And, and, and Michael... One of the things we did was go out of the classroom and into the convention center and spend time doing something special with people. What did, what did we do? We prayed with people. We prayed with them. And tell us about an experience you had. Well, uh, my group, we were um, walking and we saw three men um, speaking together and they had pamphlets with them. And we came and surrounded them, and we asked if we could pray with them. And we also asked if they had any prayer requests. And they were like, sure. And they said, um, our prayer request is that um, we can reach the Czech, Czech Republic um, with this program that we are trying to um, build. And so we prayed with them, and we prayed that God would be God would use this program to reach the Czech Republic for him. And after we left, um, the, we heard, overheard them saying, now this program will succeed. Amen, amen, amen. You know, so we've learned to embrace the gospel, learn how to give a gospel presentation, and our juniors are ready to go. That's why the gospel begins or starts with... Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Pastor Martin. You know, this group, go ahead and process out and we'll get the early teens up. This group did a survey scavenger hunt that they had to find different people to do different things with. They prayed with me. And then one little group came and said, are you over 85? I said, no, why? And they said, because we have to take a picture with somebody that's 85 or older. <laughs> Bless their hearts. <laughs> All right, early teens, come on up. We have Pastor Adams and his wife, Angela, and they are here from Oklahoma, pastor of the Choctaw Church, and they are awesome. One month ago, our 
um, early teen leader was not able to come, and they took it at the last minute. Thank you, Pastor Adams. What have you been doing? Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, my wife and I, this is our first time teaching the early teens here at ASI. As a matter of fact, this is our first time being, being at ASI. But as you can see, the young people have on shirts. Our theme for, for the class was Revelation 18.1, which says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Our theme for the class was light the world with his glory. These young people had the opportunity to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. We went to a missionary apartment, a refugee apartment complex, and were able to conduct eight laws of health along with the youth class that you'll hear more about. But these young people have been the greatest group of young people that I've worked with. So it's been a blessing to be here, and many of them have been a blessing to me. We've also had Pastor Michael Getz from 3ABN, I think, um, what was it, Creation Case? Yes. <laughs> he was our, one of our lead speakers, and these young people showed him a very good time in our classroom. Didn't we, young people? <laughs> Let's give everybody a round of applause like we did Michael Guest when he was in our classroom. <laughs> we, also learned, we also learned about the eight laws of health. We talked about exercise and fresh air and sunshine. Many of these young people already know a lot about the eight laws of health but we were able to go out and put those eight laws of health in practice with the refugee families. We didn't have the attendance we wanted, but I think there were some divine appointments. So I want to thank God for these young people, and it was a blessing working with you guys this year, and hopefully next year we'll see you guys again here at ASI. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Adams. In early teens, you can go off. Our youth department was going to be headed up by somebody who's worked at ASI before, but a few months ago his son developed a tumor in the back of his head, had to have an operation, just had an MRI. And so the heroes at this ASI is Julie and Trey Shirley, who took this over just a couple of weeks ago. And they've taken the youth in hand um, they're from Oklahoma, they're teachers, and their assistant is Kean. You want to put your hand up, Kean, so they know who you are. And they have worked with these young people. Um, Julie and Trey, if you'll come forward, there's a mic here, and you can tell us about your program this year. Here am I, send me. Right here is the... So as Ms. Claire said, uh, we found out that we would get the chance to do this just a few weeks ago. And the theme you can see on the shirts is Send Me. And so we came and we found that it's very true that whom God calls, He equips, because our first day here, we found that all of our equipment had been stolen when the trailer it was in was also stolen. But just like they're behind our youth group right now, uh, when we went searching for new equipment, we found that God already had it here. Uh, youth for Christ, uh, Youth for Jesus, excuse me, uh, had the equipment. And not only did they have the equipment, but their young people had been trained on it and joined our youth class and helped train. We were privileged to work with a great group of young people in the youth division. And uh, we just explored how God has a purpose for all of us, and He wants to call us to work for Him. I want to ask Emily, what, is your, what was your favorite part of the weekend? I'd have to say that my favorite part so far has been the health expo we did on Thursday. I really enjoyed uh, talking to the people, getting to know them better, playing with the kids, and helping them in whatever way I could. It was a great experience. I really enjoyed it. 
and also throughout this week, we've had multiple missionaries that have gone across the world come and tell us about their experience uh, that they've had in said places. Going and fulfilling God's mission and like our shirt says, have been sent by God. Um, they were also so inspiring to all of us and it would lead most people to go out themselves and also be sent forward by God. So much so that even me, my mother, and my father are going to go back to India to reinstitute our mission that we had previously gone uh, earlier this year back to India. Thank you so much for sharing that, Aiden. And I'll turn the thank you. And so tonight, thank you, youth. You can go on off. For the first time in ASI history, we're going to bring a few examples of more than 15 babies that have attended Jenny McCluskey's nursery class. Wow, you have to come and look at that nursery class. I want to be a baby again. And so, Jenny, tell us about your program. She is a teacher um, now in Texas. Some of these babies are asleep at this time, but we brought three of them. <laughs> so this uh, year I chose the theme of Jonah's underwater adventure, going with our theme of being missionaries. We had uh, water play where they were learning how deep God's love is deep as deeper than the ocean, and we can fly to the mission field, we can go in a boat to the mission field. And Jonah didn't go the right place. <laughs> he didn't say yes when he should have said yes. And we learned that we're going to say yes when God calls us to be his little missionaries. There's a quote in Child Guidance that I really love. It says, God wants every child of tender age to be his child, to be adopted into his family. Young though they may be, the youth may be members of the household of faith and have a most precious experience. They may have hearts that are tender and ready to receive impressions that are lasting. They may have their hearts drawn out in confidence and love for Jesus and live for Jesus. Christ will make them little missionaries. The whole current of their thoughts may be changed. So we have determined in baby class we are going to be God's bright shining lights, his little missionaries. Ready to sing? Ready? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> Did you like seeing the babies? We hope you'll come visit us in the youth convention. God bless you all. We are ASI Youth for Jesus, and we have been here in the Kansas City area for one month. And we are very thankful. We have a team that prays for our work every day. We just finished um, this past Tuesday our last meeting, evangelistic meeting of ASI New Beginnings Evangelism. Every young person on this stage spoke for our series of meetings uh, three to five times. Now, when we got here, we started on July 7th training them for a health outreach that we were doing on July 9th. July 7th was the Friday, July 9th was the Sunday. So it was a really fast course and July 9th, we held our meetings in two locations, one in Olathe, Kansas, and the other in Lee Summit, Missouri. These are both near Kansas City. While we were here, we have stayed 
in the Lee Summit Seventh-day Adventist Church, and uh, we've slept there. It has been our home for the past month. Um, these, these young people, each one of them, starting on July 10th, we trained them to do evangelism. And when I say we trained them, it is written, um, did our training for us. And then following that training, July 14th, the Friday, was their first meeting, and they spoke every night uh, throughout the month of July. Um, one of those speakers, her name is Angelise Sandoval. I want to turn the time over to her to let her share her story with you. Speaking for the New Beginning series was a great experience, but tonight I'm going to be talking about a health screening we did. One of the first things we did at YFJ was a health screening. There was eight different stations, nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, temperance, air, rest, and trust in God. At the nutrition station, which is where I was working, we take people's blood sugar and talk about proper diets. I grew up going to a lot of these, and so I'm very familiar with them, but this was my first time to run a station by myself. I really enjoyed stabbing people. Sometimes it's challenging to get blood out of people, and other times it comes out freely. At the exercise station, we do a step test. At the water station, we talk about the importance of water. At the sunshine station, we take people's blood pressure and talk about the importance of sunshine. At the temperance station, we measure and weigh people and take their BMI. At the air station, we do a peak flow breathing test and talk about air. At the rest station, we give massages and talk about rest. And at the trust in God station, we have a health age test and health counseling. One of the great parts of our program was the evangelism training, which was by It Is Written. And now I want to introduce Wes Peppers, who was one of our It Is Written trainers. It was a really a great privilege for It Is Written to partner with ASI Youth for Jesus and provide training for these young people. And you know, just in a few short weeks, we saw a transformation in their lives. They're coming closer to Jesus, thinking about more spiritual things, having a burden for the lost, and it was just really exciting to see that transformation, and only God can do that. And I wanna say these are some of the future leaders of ASI, these are future leaders in the church, these are future pastors, a fantastic army of young people standing before you. And so we had a number of classes that we did with them, Eric Flickinger, myself, and other members from our evangelism team, and it is written, we did some Bible doctrine classes with them. We talked, we studied Bible prophecy together. We gave them reasons for their faith. So we studied Christian and Adventist apologetics. We looked at archeology. span We looked at personal and public evangelism. So they got training uh, to share their faith. And so it was really exciting. And they learned how to write their own Bible studies from scratch to pick any topic in the Bible, to study it through, and then be able to write a Bible study. We showed them a very simple method on how to do that, and they wrote their own Bible studies while they were there. We also shared with them principles of public evangelism and the cycle of evangelism and how to implement that in the local church and the community. So it was very exciting, but they didn't just get uh, you know, classes in the classroom. They didn't just get the philosophical piece. They actually preached their own evangelistic meetings. They actually gave Bible studies, and they actually got hands-on experience with ministry in the community. So that was very, very exciting. And I'm very thankful for these young people. God has just matured them. He's grown them. They're equipped for the work, and I'm excited for the future of our church. Amen? We want Jesus to come, but I believe the future is bright and the best is yet to come. And God is going to fill His Spirit uh, with, in these young people. He's going to fill them with His Spirit, and He's going to do remarkable things through them. And I just wanted to say that ASI Youth for Jesus is more than just information. It's really transformation. 
It's more than just a program, it's discipleship. And it's more than just a classroom experience, it's a journey with Jesus. And these young people have begun that journey and it's gonna to continue to grow, it's gonna to continue to deepen and widen until Jesus comes. And I believe and I'm confident that they are equipped to witness for Jesus anywhere, any place, to any person. And God has blessed them. So we at It Is Written look very much forward to continuing to partner with ASI Youth for Jesus and provide that evangelism, training, and experience in the future. I greatly appreciated the efforts of the It Is Written team. Uh, pastor Phillips isn't here to be with us, but I want to individually thank each of the pastors that helped us. Thank you to Pastor Flickinger, to Pastor Peppers, and to Pastor Phillips. One thing that I noticed and that I appreciated is that outside of classes and in classes, each of the pastors tried to relate with us and socialize with us. Both, path both Pastor Phillips and Pastor Flickinger told us that they're not naturally very extroverted, but I saw them make effort to try to relate to, I relate to us and socialize with us. One thing about me is that I love to ask questions, but I most times don't ask those questions because I feel like I'll annoy the presenter. But with the It Is Written team, I felt comfortable to ask any questions that I had at any time. When they would answer my questions, they wouldn't just be trying to get past the question, but they would make sure that I understood and they would explain it over until I did understand. Even though there's a, just a little small age gap between all, us and the pastors, I consider each of them to be friends. I had many conversations that impacted me and stood out to me, but there was one conversation that stood out in particular, and that was a conversation that I had with Pastor Peppers in the car, in the car drive to a restaurant that we went to. One reason that I actually came back to Youth for Jesus this year is because of the conversations that I would have with the boys last year at night. This conversation that I had with Pastor Peppers reminded me of that. He made me feel understood and he made me feel heard. And I greatly appreciated all the works that all of them did. One part of the program that I enjoyed was our health program. And one of our main speakers for that was Rachel Beckworth. So I'll hand it over to her. Thanks, Story. So each side of our series, we briefly presented on a different topic regarding health. We started with the eight laws of health from New Start. For those of you who don't know, New Start is an acronym created by Weimar Institute that covers eight health principles. These principles are used around the world and have helped hundreds of thousands of people to regain their health and stay strong. After covering these eight principles for the first eight nights, we moved on to other health topics. We helped inform the community on common diseases, illnesses, and conditions and then shared steps we can take to either prevent them or relieve symptoms. For example, we cover topics like depression, arthritis and osteoporosis, cancer, and diabetes. Over the span of just a few weeks, both the attendees and myself had learned a lot about health, from the way our bodies work to tips on proper nutrition. I personally really appreciated that these health talks were included as a part of each of our meetings because then not only were we learning about our creator, but we were also learning about the bodies that he made for us. The Bible says our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So not only are we taking care of ourselves, but we're honoring God. There's a verse that we would also commonly include at the end of our health talks found in John 10.10. 10. It says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I really love this reminder and it helped me keep in mind throughout our seminars, how much life and restoration God's message can bring and how much more abundant our lives can be with Jesus. Now I'd like to introduce Marco Medina, who is one of the main speakers at our Olathe location. Thank you, Rachel. Well, I was one of the main speakers of the ASI New Beginnings seminars that we held at the Olathe Church. I spoke on five different topics. I went through Matthew 24 and Jesus's prophecies on how we are living in the end of times. Next, I went over how we can accept salvation and accept Jesus as Christ. After that, I went over a study called The Importance of Baptism. I also did a study called Secrets from Beyond the Grave, in which we saw what the Bible had to say about spirits and the state of the dead. 
in the very beginning, at my first YFJ experience, I was very nervous to speak up front. But afterwards, I even began to start giving sermons at my local church. Now, I know that a lot of us are scared of speaking up front, and I would like to pass the mic to Renelli Compres, who, is also, who, who also at the beginning was nervous. Thanks, Marco. I get very nervous when speaking to people I don't know, and I get even more nervous when speaking publicly, surrounded by people I don't know. So when Mr. Baker told me that I would be one of the main speakers, I got extremely nervous. So nervous I couldn't sleep when, <laughs> the night before my presentation. So my dean and some of my friends came and prayed with me that night. When the day of the presentation came, uh, when we had gotten to the church, we prayed before we exited the van, and again before it was time for me to present. After that day, I have felt how God has been working in my life and helping me to manage my anxiety and my nervousness, especially when going door to door. It doesn't mean I don't get nervous or anxious anymore, but I can see how God is working in my life, especially when it comes to serving Him. Even though there weren't many people coming to our meetings in the Olathe Church. We still had a lot of people viewing us through Facebook. So Pastor Flickinger from It Is Written will be talking to us more about that. Thank you, Renali. It has been a real privilege for It Is Written to partner with ASI's Youth for Jesus program this year and to see God working in the lives of each of these young people. And the people that are being reached are not just the ones that you see up here on the screen, up on the stage. Their lives have most certainly been changed. But through the outreach into the communities that they've done, and through the sermons that they have preached in their evangelistic series, church members' lives were changed. People from the community had their lives changed as well. But also, both of the presentations, both of the series that were being preached, in Olathe and in Lee's Summit were being live streamed on Facebook, and many people were watching those presentations. Not only that, they've been archived and people are watching the archives. Now, some people have even been watching from overseas because the Olathe Church has seven Bible workers, indigenous Bible workers, over in Papua New Guinea. Those Bible workers were watching the presentations, downloading them, storing them on their cell phones, and then going out into the jungles of Papua New Guinea and sharing these young people's presentations with people in the jungles of Papua New Guinea. Amen. So God is doing incredible work. And what you're seeing up here on the stage is just a glimpse of what God is doing. So thank you so much for your support of the Youth for Jesus program because lives are being changed all over the world. Amen. As I look back on this road I've traveled, I see so many times He's carried me through. And if there's one thing that I've learned in this life, my Redeemer is faithful and true. My Redeemer is faithful and true. Everything he has said he will do Every morning his mercies are new Rejoices when I feel 
Happy Sabbath, ASI. Since the beginning of the convention, during all of the in general sessions, we have shared with you nine of the projects of the 32 that are listed in your program booklet. And I just wanted to come out to ask you to pray for two things tonight. I want you to pray and ask God for an abundant overflow so that we can extend the reach of these ministries. We have three overflow projects that we'll be sharing equally in the receipts of the overflow. The Ellen White Electronic Book Project, the OCI Missionaries for Unreached Regions, and the One Day Church Roofs Over Africa. You'll hear about four of them tomorrow. But I really want to implore all of us to pray and ask God, what is it that he would have us do at this time, in this place, for the benefit of these projects so that we can hasten his soon coming? Matthew 24, 14 says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a testimony unto all nations, and then the end will come. I pray that it is our privilege to make that happen. For those of you who may be watching online, you don't have a booklet, but you can go to the ASI website, asiministries.org, and see the projects listed there. We want to invite you, too, to join us in this remarkable opportunity to be able to lift the hands of those who are serving Christ. Thank you, and have a blessed Sabbath. This evening, it is my real privilege to introduce to you, and he will be speaking in just a few moments after some special music, Dwayne Esmond. Dwayne is an ordained minister. He has editorial background as well. He worked at the Review and Herald Publishing Association. I worked with him there uh, some years ago. Uh, he then became uh, the editor of Insight Magazine, uh, then the vice president for the Review and Herald Editorial Services, and in 2015 was called to the Ellen G. White Estate to be an associate director. He has been there for some time and a very powerful witness to many people regarding the wonderful writings of Ellen White, The Spirit of Prophecy. Not too long ago, Duane showed up in my office, asked for an appointment, and wanted to share with me a real burden that he had. He was very worried about contemporary generations, including older ones, but especially younger ones, who were spending 
more time on their electronic gadgets and receiving their, quote, spiritual instruction from social media as opposed to the Bible. He had a real burden that we needed to start something called Back to the Altar. I want to tell you it has been a great blessing for the General Conference to launch Back to the Altar, an opportunity for young people and older ones to turn back to the true worship of God collectively as families and as individuals. In fact, you can read more about Back to the Altar in the Adventist Review, Adventist World. You just saw Justin Kim, our new editor, who was here with you just uh, not long ago this evening. And we have a new editorial team in many areas, and they are producing spiritual, biblical, evangelistic material in the Adventist Review and Adventist World. You can read about Back to the Altar, but even more, you can hear about it tonight, for I know that Elder Duane Esmond is going to share with you something powerful, and as you leave tonight, your life will be changed because we are going back to the Lord in a powerful way. May God bless you as you listen to Duane Esmond this evening.
Would you say amen again for Fountain View? What a blessing. I think I own at least 20 or 30,000 views on YouTube of Fountain View videos. I am a fan and totally blessed by the wonderful ministry that they perform for God. Are you happy that it's the Sabbath? One, two, three, four, five, six, rest. That's the cadence of life. I enjoy the Sabbath, I love the Sabbath, and I want to wish you, ASI, a happy, happy Sabbath. Amen. I know you've been blessed to be here. If you have been blessed to be at this convention, would you just say amen? amen. Have you been blessed by the seminars? Amen. amen. And all the wonderful speakers, it has been terrific. I want to say a word of appreciation to Andy, our fearless leader of ASI, and her entire team, to Pastor Philip Baptiste, and to all the staff, everyone who's responsible for allowing me to run around this stage tonight. I honor God, I thank God for you, and it is an absolute blessing to be here. I count it a privilege whenever I can say anything for God. I don't know about you, but I never feel qualified. I feel like the gospel is better than I am, that God is holier than I will ever be. And so any opportunity that I get to lift up the name of Jesus, I want to take it because my God is a wonderful, awesome God. Amen? And He is worthy to be praised. I bring you greetings from the LNG White estate. Uh, that's where I work. but. Work is not quite the right word for what I do. I, I, I enjoy so much the privilege of sharing the writings of Ellen White around the world. And so on behalf of the White Estate, our director, Dr. Merlin Burt, the men and women of the White Estate all around the globe, we salute you. And we want to thank ASI. ASI has made White Estate ministry something truly spectacular. Millions of people are accessing Ellen White's writings in places where there are no Seventh-day Adventists simply because of the giftedness and the blessings that ASI has showered on us. It is a blessing to partner with you in ministry, and I salute you and I thank you tonight for your support of the Ellen G. White estate. Brothers and sisters, I came to this conference and when I went to registration, I was blessed. There were some people, at, some young people at registration, and one young man came to me and he said, Pastor, do you recognize me? And I said, no, sir, I, 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 I hate to say it, but, but I don't recognize you. He said, hold on one second, let me show you a picture. And so I want to show you the picture he showed me. Is that all right? Is, is it up? Ah, oh, there it is. That's, that's Raymond, that's Raymond, that's little Raymond. Uh, that goes back about eight years. I was at at Maxwell Academy on the campus of the East Central Africa Division doing a week of prayer there, and I baptized that little boy. And that little boy, that little boy uh, is making me look like a little boy. Somehow I'm growing down and he is growing up. I cannot tell you what a blessing it is to serve Jesus. Isn't that why we do what we do? It is so we can see men and women, boys and girls saved. Oh, the matchless, mighty grace of God. If you've allowed your Bibles to come with you, whether they be digital, if you're joining us online, you're a, the Facebook faithful, or you're a 3ABN family, you're a digital disciple, whoever you are, if you would open your Bibles with me to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 57, Beginning now at verse 15, Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15, the Bible reads this way in the New King James Version, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. For I will not contend forever, thank you God, nor will I always be angry, thank you God, for the spirit would fail before me and the souls which I have made. Verse 17, for the iniquity of, of, the, of his covetousness, I was angry and I struck him. 
I hid and I was angry. And he went on backsliding in the way of his heart. Verse 18, I have seen his way, says God, and will heal him. I will also lead him, says God, and restore comforts to him and to his mourners. Verse 19, I create the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to him who is far off, and to him who is near, says the Lord, peace. Father God, in the name of Jesus, would you speak now to your people, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, if there be any glory, God, take it, for it only belongs to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. I want to thank my president for his kind introduction of me. Uh, Elder Wilson and I go back a ways, and I thank God for him, and specifically, especially for his support of a very special initiative that is transforming this church, the Back to the Altar initiative that calls us back to our places of worship with God. I appreciate his leadership and his ministry. Well, at this time, I've entitled our time together tonight, I'm with him, I'm with him. Grace is ASI, the single best thing that we as humans have going for us. We are the beneficiaries of no ordinary grace, for we have received a very special form of grace that some scholars call prevenient grace. John Wesley, the English theologian, evangelist, and hymn writer, taught that there are three aspects of grace of which we should be very, very excited tonight. There's the stealthy, imperceptible grace of God that woos us to God before we even are aware of our lost condition. This is the grace of benevolent coincidences and unexplained favor and unmerited blessings and planes that land. It is the goodness of God wielded in the hand of the Holy Spirit that leads us to repentance, the, the prevenient grace of God that precedes our conversion. But Wesley doesn't stop there. He also taught justifying grace. That's the grace of God that restores us to God when we become aware of His great love for us. This is the grace that is poured out in, 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 in scars through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It reconciles and it reconnects and it reestablishes our relationship with God, justifying grace. While prevenient grace woos us and justifying grace renews us, Wesley also talked about sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace, grace that brings us ever closer to God, grace that reproduces His character in us, grace that changes every facet of our being, grace that woos and grace that renews and grace that eschews evil in our lives so that we become what God dreamed us up to be, grace, amazing grace. ASI, are you thankful for the grace of God tonight that we experience. It's grace for the mixed up. When we are lost and we don't even know the extent of our existential condition, grace comes along with the other twin, mercy. Grace and mercy apprehend us, looking for us. It's grace not just for the mis mixed up, it's grace for the messed up. For Ephesians 2 verses 4 and 5 tell us, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love wherewith he has loved us, uh, that he has made us alive together while we were dead in trespasses and sins. He made us to, uh, alive with Christ Jesus and has seated us in heavenly places in Christ. It's grace for the messed up. It's grace for the mixed up. It's grace for the mashed up. It's grace for people who get run over in life, left on the highways and the byways of life by an enemy that we did not see coming. Like some roadkill, it leaves us there, but this grace of God is so good that it heals our broken spirits and reforms our habits and fills us with power to live righteously and soberly as we see the coming of Jesus. This grace is so good that God puts, put it in human flesh and and, and, and put bones and, and, and tissues and, and, and emotions with it and called him Jesus. This man, Christ Jesus, the, what I call the CGO of the universe, the chief grace officer of the universe, dispensing the grace of God for all humanity. Whosoever will, let them come and receive 
this grace. ASI, I want to say to you tonight, grace is the single best thing we humans have going for us. One Julia Johnston, daughter of a minister and a poet, penned some memorable lines that we know today. She wrote, marvelous grace of our loving Lord. I'm going somewhere, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace, grace, God's grace. Let's say it together, grace that is greater than all our sin. What an amazing bless is love, love initiating, new life animating, habit changing, relationship sustaining, power infilling, witness empowering, church unifying, member transforming, Seventh-day Adventist sending grace. Grace for us to do exactly what God has put us on this planet to do. Every now and again, you ought to look in the mirror. Look past the bangs and look past the freckles. Look past the hairdo and the nice clothes. Look past that mahogany skin and see yourself encircled. That's Ellen White's word for it. Encircled by the grace of God. Steps to Christ, page 68. In the matchless gift of his son, God has encircled the world with an atmosphere of grace as real as the air that we breathe. All who choose to breathe this life-giving atmosphere will live and grow up to the stature of men and women in Christ. Amazing grace looks awfully good on us. Two weeks ago, while I was preaching in the nation of Fiji at Fulton University, a young man walked up to me after the service drenched in this grace. He had a twinkle in his eye, and you could see the grace on him from afar, transformed by grace. The God who launched this grace-filled plan of redemption is the God who shouts at us in Isaiah chapter 15, 57 and verse 15, for thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him, with him. I dwell in the high and holy place, but also with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. I don't know if you got that or you missed it, ASI, but my, I, want, I want you to know tonight that, that, that Isaiah is struggling in this passage to capture the grandeur of God. He calls him high and he calls him lofty. Remember now, this is the Isaiah who saw the Lord in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah 6 and verse 1, saw the Lord high and lifted up. He saw God's train filling the temple. The vision of God that Isaiah saw back in 6, is still the vision he sees in 57. I'm amazed by this servant of God. God is lifted up in Isaiah 6, and God is still lifted up in Isaiah 57. Isaiah prophesied during the reigns of four kings, five if you count Manasseh, uh, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and Manasseh, who tradition holds, hollowed out a tree, put Isaiah in it, and then sawed him in two. Most scholars believe that his ministry lasted probably about 40 years. So between uh, Isaiah 6 and Isaiah 57, this servant of God has been faithful to God for decades, and somehow he, God remains lofty in his view in, the, in spite of the passage of time. This means that Isaiah has sustained a high view of God, though all the ups and downs of ministry have been around him. Through all the idolatry of Judah, through all the taunts of the terrible, and all the jeers of the jealous, through all those who tried to buy his silence, and those who tried to compel him violently into compliance. In all of it, Isaiah never lowers his view of God. He never lowers God's commands for fear of offending people. 
He never lowers God's standards in order to meet sinners where they are. He never compromises God's call to appeal to appease men and women. He exalted God and called people up higher to God. He lifted God and called people to walk straighter with God. He elevated God and called people to live closer with God. Isaiah, Isaiah's God is lifted in 6, and he's lifted in 57. I want to tell you tonight, ASI, keep your God nice and high. Keep your God lifted up. When your obedience is called legalism, ASI, uh, keep your God high. When your righteousness is called religion, ASI, keep your God high. When your faithfulness is called fanaticism, keep your God high. When your peculiarity is called strange, even though it's simply being distinct and distinguishable, keep your God high. When your love for Christ is called losing in life, oh, ASI, keep your God high. Keep your God up there where you can see him. Oh, yes, that's a good way. That's a good reason to put your hands together. Keep that God up where the world can see him. Keep him up high. David says, I will look to the hills. Psalm 121 and verse 1, from whence cometh my help? My help comes from on high. It comes from the God who made heaven, the God who made earth. The only way, beloved, that Isaiah could have sustained such a high view of God was that Isaiah had to have daily communion with God. The only way that Isaiah could have sustained such a high view of God, Isaiah had a worship altar for God. He had a place where he was refreshed by fresh revelations of God's righteousness, fresh vistas of God's holiness, fresh drafts of God's steadfastness, fresh uh, scenes of God's loveliness. Listen to Ellen White. Ellen White says this about this prophet of God in, in, in Prophets and Kings, page 315. The prophet exalted God. As creator of all, his message to the cities of Judah was, Behold your God. He could not preach a behold your God message if he was not beholding God. Isaiah was watching God. And because he was watching God, he could tell people about the picture of God that he saw. Isaiah had an altar where he met with his God. Oh, precious ASI family, do you have an altar? How's your altar tonight? Isaiah had a place for God in his life, and Seventh-day Adventists, wherever they are, ought to have a place for God in our lives. We must make time for morning and evening views of God, morning and evening panoramas of praise, morning and evening perspectives on his providence. If we want to see his glory, he must be daily in our story. If we want to see his majesty, he must be regularly in our vicinity. If God is not with us, we are powerless to change this world. And oh, beloved, do we have a world to win. In chapter 57 and verse 15, Isaiah introduces the God, introduces God to Judah, uh, almost reading God's LinkedIn profile. Name God, title, high and lofty one address, eternity. And I could hear God say, yes, Isaiah, that's good. You gave me some credit, but I'm more than what you said I am. You've got, you've got the place right. I, I dwell in the high and the holy place. You got that right. But I don't just live on high, Isaiah. I live low as well. I am the God not just that flies at 30,000 feet and eons above earth. I am the God who can dwell down with my people if they need me. ASI, this act of God is really beyond human comprehension. So I've got to take a moment to see if I can get this point to you another way. You got to understand that the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah de uh, de uh, give a, paint a, a devastating picture of Judah's depravity and Judah's sin. 39 chapters to explain the level of Judah's depravity. The first 11 verses of Isaiah chapter 57 are a perfect, startling, frightening summary 
of what Judah was up to. Verse 3, Judah says, God says to Judah, you left me for other lovers. That's spiritual ad adultery. Verse 4, Judah, you ridicule others while you yourself are in sin. That's spiritual apostasy. Verse 5, Judah, you inflame yourselves with other gods, and under every green tree you sacrifice your children. You would heat up Molech and, and burn your children on his arms. God says to Judah, Judah, you are committing spiritual apostasy. In verse 11, God is so stunned, God is so dismayed by his people that he says to them, you do all of this and you're not even afraid of me. Now you know you've got to be crazy if you're going to sin like this, beloved, and not be afraid of the God of heaven. But that was the Judah. And it is of this Judah that God says, I am ready to come to you. This Judah with all of its problems. The first 39 chapters of this book, frightful depravity of Judah's sin. But I'm so glad that God, beloved, does not end the book at 39. I'm so glad tonight that the book of Isaiah doesn't end with just the first 39 chapters. Chapters 1 to 39 are Judah's depravity and sin, but then chapters 40 to 48 are the supremacy of the Lord. Chapters 49 to 53, the suffering Savior, Jesus Christ. Chapters 54 to 66, God's future plan for his people. Let me try it another way. Chapters 1 to 39, sin, disobedience, and impending judgment. Chapters 40 to 48, the sovereignty and sanctity of God Almighty. Chapters 49 to 53, Jesus, Jesus, and more Jesus. Chapters 54 to 66, help, healing, and hope. Let me try it another way. Chapters 1 to 39, listen to me, beloved. Judah has messed up. Chapters 40 to 48, God has risen up. Chapters 49 to 53, Jesus shows up. Chapters 54 to 66, humanity goes up. God has got a word for us tonight. And that word for us tonight is, I'm with them in spite of their issues. If I catch a whiff of contrition, if I see the minorest flicker of repentance, if my people humble themselves, I'm with him. I am with them. Oh, that's great news for us tonight, beloved, because it says that God is not repelled by our stuff. He is attracted by our stuff. Chapters 1 to 39, sin and degradation. 40 to 48, God and reclamation. 49 to 53, Jesus and reconciliation. 54 to 66, revival and reformation. We are in the revival portion of this scripture tonight. It is where our church is. It is where the people of God are. We are in need of God's reviving power that we might witness to his goodness and lead men and women to know him. Isaiah tells, tell Judah, Isaiah, I dwell in the high and holy place, but that's not the only place where I live. My address does not prevent me from dwelling where my people are. I'm with him who has a contrite heart. I'm with him who has a humble spirit. Isaiah, don't just give them my address. Tell them that I want to live with them. I am the high low God. I am here, but I'm also down there. And if they need me, tell ASI that I am the God who comes down to meet with them. Oh, beloved, I don't know about you tonight, but I need a God. I got God-sized problems. I have God-sized challenges. If my God is not, if my God that I'm working with is not big enough, I really need to get me another God because this world in which we are living requires the God of the universe to empower us to make change. The stench of Israel's sin of Judah's sin had reached up to heaven. God was smelling them. I don't know about you, beloved, but there are times when I don't always smell that great. I remember one time I was playing a little basketball back when I was young. I used to think I could play a little bit. 
could run a little bit, jump a little bit. Uh, there was a, some older guys that I used to play with, and there was one guy that nobody wanted to guard. Uh, nobody would guard him. Nobody wanted to check him because there were, there were things emanating from his body that did not make anyone want to be close to him. He had an offensive weapon and a defensive weapon. <laughs> nobody wanted, wanted to be close. If you had, and they would put me on him because I was young, they would say, Dwayne, you go guard him. And when I left that game with him leading on me all game, beloved, nobody wanted me in their car to take me home. I had to walk home. Uh, his stench repelled us. I think he did it on purpose, if you ask me. Beloved, I want to tell you tonight that we don't smell that great to God. That if he was to really look at us, we don't smell all that great. Our smelly behaviors and our smelly attitudes and the things about us that don't recommend us to God are things that, that need to be taken away in the blood of Jesus Christ. But I'm here to tell you tonight that which uh, might repel other people compels our Savior. That that which pushes people away attracts Jesus to us. Our stench does not distract him. Our stench attracts him. I'm so thankful tonight, beloved, that even though I don't always look the part or smell the part, Jesus still wants to be with me. The Bible says in 1 John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our stench, he is faithful and just to forgive our stench and to, clean and to cleanse us from all stenchness. That's what the Bible says. That's, that's the Bible I'm reading. I don't know which one you're reading tonight. But there's one in John chapter 6 and verse 7. He that cometh unto me with his stench, I will in no wise cast out with his stench. My Bible says in Isaiah 55 and verse 7, let the wicked forsake his stench and the unrighteous man his smelly stench and let them return unto the Lord and he will have mercy unto him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. All right, I know it's not in the Bible. Somebody's going to catch me tonight. The, the word in the Bible is sin. And I want you to know sin stinks. Sin doesn't smell good to God. But God says to us in all of our aromas, he says to us tonight, I dwell with those who are contrite, with those who are humble in spirit. I look for those who are willing to get as low as possible that I might exalt them and lift them up. I remember driving back from a conference when I got a whiff of myself. I had left a wonderful conference, and on the drive home, I decided to shut down my phone and just think about God. Uh, you know, Ellen White talks about taking a thoughtful hour and contemplating the final scenes of the life of Jesus Christ, and I decided I would try that. And let me tell you, beloved, when I began to think about Jesus and consider the righteousness and holiness of God, in the light of that, I began to see myself. And as I began to see myself, beloved, tears start to fall on my face. Tears ran down my face for hours on that drive as God broke my heart and reminded me, son, you're not what you should be, but I want to be with you in spite of your condition. Lord, help us when we see ourselves in the light of God's sinless purity. Oh, what a mighty, awesome, thank you, my brother, my sister, my sister, my sister. Oh, what an awesome, wonderful, mighty God we serve. I dwell on high, but I also dwell with those who are of a broken and a contrite spirit. God had tried everything, beloved, to get Judah to change. Watch me now. He had threatened them. He had punished them. He had hidden his face from them. Let's read it in, in Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 17. For the iniquity of his covetousness, says God, I was angry and I struck him. I hid and I was angry. He, and he went on backsliding in the ways of his heart. God says, I, I, I've tried everything. I, I spanked them. I, I, I ghosted them. I was angry with them. But, but, but nothing changed them. So God says, I'm going to change my strategy. 
I'm going to change my strategy. God faced a powerful conundrum now. He picks up on something. And I need you to stick with me right here. I'm going to push you a little bit, ASI. God's punishments now are, are not just regular punishments. God's punishments are designed to bring about change and reformation in our lives. Amen? When we are wrong, beloved, God doesn't quite work like us. When we are wrong, we are out for blood. When, when God is wrong, he's out for change. When we are wrong and we are hurt, we're out for revenge. When God is hurt, he wants repentance. When something is taken from us, we want restitution. When we take ourselves from God, he wants revival and reformation. We are not like God in this way. God was seeking Judah's repentance. God was seeking Judah's revival. God was seeking Judah's restoration. God was after change. Judah, if you humble yourself, I will dwell with you. Judah, if you simply spend time with me, I'll dwell with you. To revive the spirit of your humble people, to revive the heart of the contrite ones. I'm not just with you, Judah, to be with you. I'm with you to transform you. I don't know about you tonight, but I need to be transformed into the image of Almighty God. I need God with me tonight. ASI, I don't know how nimble you are. Can you change? Can you follow God when he changes course? God changes course in the middle of this situation. And he is the God who in Isaiah 43 and verse 19 says, I do new things. I do brand new things. There is a powerful message here for the people of God, beloved. God says to us in this fraught moment that the Seventh-day Adventist church is existing, that, 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 that we can always rely on our anger and our censure and our punitive powers for those who are in sin. Beloved, there's sometimes when we've got to exercise great caution with people who are in sin. The Bible tells us that we are called to cry aloud and to spare not to show God's people their transgressions and the house of Jacob its sins. Isaiah 58 and verse 1. We have been set as watchmen in the world. Testimonies, volume 9, page 19. We have been set as watchmen and light bearers in the world, writes Ellen White. To them, to us, has been granted and trusted the last warning for a perishing world. On us is shined a wonderful light from the Word of God. There, there has been, uh, we have a special work to do, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There is no other work of so great importance. We are to allow nothing else to absorb our attention. We have a mighty work to do. We have a mighty world to win. We have a mighty world to warn. God has called us to do something consequential for Him. We've got to do it, and we've got to proclaim powerfully our message. But I want to suggest to you tonight, beloved, that, that, that proclamation and, uh, is not our only tool. I want to tell you tonight, beloved, that, that, that we've got other end times tools in our toolbox. We have got some other tools that God wants us to use. We've got love and we've got joy and we've got peace and we've got long suffering and we've got kindness and we've got gentleness and we've got faithfulness and we've got self-control. God has given us mighty tools to use at the end of time to bring men and women to him. God has given us mighty, mighty tools. In Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 16, God realizes that proclamation and punishment was breaking the spirit of his people. He saw the, the, the resignation in their eyes. He saw the forlorn looks. He saw the gaunt stares and the resignation in their walks. And God says, I'm changing. I'm changing. I could spot a trend. I could spot the tea leaves. I know my people are not being encouraged by what I have been doing to them. So God says, I am changing. Beloved, I have watched and I have seen sometimes when, when, when I have hammered people as a pastor. I remember one time I was preaching before some young people at a conference many years ago. After the conference was over, after I had got done speaking, some young men stayed by. Not too many people were hanging around them. And they came to me and they said, Pastor, can we talk to you? I said, yes, of course. They, they said, you know, you, you really preached a very powerful sermon today. I said, well, thank you. Were you blessed by it? They said, oh, yeah, we were blessed by it. They said, Pastor, you really hammered us today. We're the people you were talking about. You know, when you were talking about those homosexual people, we're those people. Powerful. They said, Pastor, I mean, uh, you, you, you did an excellent job. We're convicted. But Pastor, do you know how to love us? Do you know 
how to lead us to Christ now. I, do you have any grace for us, Pastor? I left that meeting with pain in my heart because when you have, beloved, only a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I had hammered them without the grace of God. And I came to tell you tonight, beloved, that grace is the best thing we've got going for us. That while we might proclaim the love of Jesus Christ and while we've got to tell people where they are wrong, beloved, we've got to love people like Jesus did. The Bible says he had this charge against him. This man receiveth sinners and eats with them. Jesus loved people back to God. It taught me that day you've got to have more than one weapon in your toolbox. Uh, we've got to be better. We've got to be people who, like Jesus, can change. The Bible says that God decides, I am going to put my stamp on my people. I'm no longer going to hide my face from them. I'm going to be with them because I'm not after recalcitrance. I want reconciliation. I don't want revulsion. I want revival. Beloved, I'm here to tell you tonight that God is telling us I'm with this Seventh-day Adventist church. I'm with this church, but if I'm going to be with this church, this church has to love the lost. This church has to be my hands and my feet. And the love of Jesus Christ has to encircle the loss. This church has got to be okay getting messy with people's lives and loving them back to Jesus Christ. This precious church knows a thing or two about revival. It was on October 22, 1844 that the pioneer hearts were broken. It was on that fateful night when they expected Jesus to come that their hopes were dashed and their spirits were downcast. It was on that night when Hiram Epson writes so powerfully, we wept and wept all night until the day dawned. It was on that night, beloved, when they were broken that Jesus came to them, that God found them and encouraged them when their spirits were contrite and their hearts were humbled. The Bible tells us that God is attracted to our contrition. They knew they had made a mistake. And they went back to their altars, weeping and praying. The revival was, was, was led by prayer. The revival was led by a commitment to the Word of God. The revival of our pioneers renewed their commitment to Bible study. It renewed their passion for prayer. It came with a renewed determination to witness. Seventh-day Adventists, we have revival in our DNA. We are here today because they were revived yesterday. We're here today because they renewed their walks with God and gave us a sacred trust that we have that we might help men and women come to know the Jesus Christ that renewed and revived them. I don't know if you're here tonight. I don't know if you can count, but I can count just a little bit. When I count, 57 comes before 58. Isaiah 57 is followed by Isaiah 58. And I want to tell you something tonight, ASI. There's a reason why God does work with his people to revive them in 57. It's because they've got work to do in 58. And listen to God now. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To lose the bonds of wickedness? To undo heavy burdens? To, set the, to let the oppressed go free? And, you, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring the house, bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go forth. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? 58 comes after 57. When we are revived by God, we are revived to work for God. We are revived to witness for God. We are united by God. We are transformed by God. And we are sent by God. But first things first, beloved, we've got to go back to our altars and be revived by the God who says, I'm with you. God says to us tonight, I've got mighty work for my people to do. 
we are called to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, to set the oppressed free, to break every yoke. We must feed the hungry, beloved, and we must clothe the naked, and we must help those who are in need. God is calling us to be a people who are empowered to change the world. I'm so blessed when I walk through that exhibit area and I see all the powerful ministries that you perform. God bless you, ASI. Don't stop serving this God. Don't stop giving your best to this God. He is calling upon us to bring men and women to Him because He wants them to know the love of Jesus Christ. We are God's hands and we are God's food. Uh, feet. In Isaiah 57, God works with Judah. In Isaiah 58, God wants Judah to work with him. In 57, God promises Judah revival. In 58, God wants Judah to revive the world. In 57, God promises to heal Judah. In 58, God wants Judah to help him heal the world. In 57, God promises to lead Judah. In 58, God wants Judah to lead men and women to him. In 57, God promises comfort to Judah. In 58, God wants Judah to comfort the lost. I came to tell you tonight, beloved, that God has got a powerful message for us. He wants us to know that He is with us, that He won't leave us nor forsake us. He wants to revive us tonight, that we might love and revive us, that we might give and revive us, that we might comfort and revive us, that we might live. He wants us to be transformed, that we might transform others and lead them to Jesus Christ. Oh, my precious family, I want to tell you, I'll finish this story. I got 1.21 left on this clock. Right now, I want to tell you about a young man who has the abiding power of Jesus in him. His name is Kibron Ali. Do we have that photo? My friend Kibron, that's the young man who had Jesus all over him. When he walked up to me, he was a Muslim, a young man eight months ago, just a Muslim, and Kibron uh, uh, was, was having very difficult times and, and struggling to come to know God. And he said, Jesus, if you're real, speak to me. Come to me. And he told me as I talked to him that night, he said, Pastor, I lay down in my bed, and that night Jesus came to me in a dream. He said, Jesus began to tell me, I'm your God. I love you, and I'll lead you, and I'll guide you. He said that was eight months ago. I said, Kibron, how's it going right now? He said, Dwayne, he's still with me. He said, Pastor, Jesus tells me what to do. Jesus tells me where to go. Jesus abides with me. Jesus is with me. Oh, beloved, precious family of God, the word of God to each of us tonight is this. I'm with you. If I catch a whiff of your contrition, if I catch just a little bit of your humility, if you give me a little bit of your repentance, ASI, I'm with you. Not just with you, but to revive you, to unite you and transform you, and then to send you. Oh, dear precious Father, abide with us.
Say amen again. Thank you, Fountain View. Would you rise with me tonight? If you want to say to God tonight, Lord, I want you with me. I want your spirit. I want your reviving power. I want to know that when I walk out of this room, Lord, you walk with me. If that is your desire tonight, would you just indicate by the raising of your hand? Oh, dear precious Father, you see the hands, Lord. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious, loving, heavenly Father, God, we would see Jesus. We want to be where Jesus is. We want to feel the presence of the Savior in our lives and in our hearts. God. If you could revive Judah, you can revive us. So, Father God, I pray in this moment that your Holy Spirit will come now and overshadow us, that each and every home under the sound of my voice, whether in this auditorium or online or wherever people are viewing, Lord, this ministry tonight, I pray that they will experience the indwelling power of God. And dear Father, when all is said and done, may we finish the work that you have committed to us, revived to witness, unified as a body of faith, transformed by your love, sent by your spirit with power to change the world. Thank you, God, for the blessed privilege of being with you tonight. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.